Hello everyone and welcome to the 27th video in the TypeScript Game Engine tutorial series. In this video it's my goal to actually finish up the implementation of this game so that we can actually move on to um, bigger and better projects uh, with our game engine. So I'm gonna try and move a little bit faster in this um, than the normal so I'm not going to stop and explain as many things as I go along because I think you guys kind of will understand a lot of what I'm doing so I'm just going to kind of go at a little bit more of a rapid pace and if you guys have any questions about it feel free to hit me up in the comments and I can definitely answer them for you. Okay so uh, first off let's just do a sanity check here and let's do a quick build and run. Right. So where we left off is we basically have our bitmap text up here that's going to keep our score and we have our duck and we can play uh, the game if we send some messages via the console. Uh, but we don't really want to have to do that. So in order to actually facilitate uh, being able to send those messages through user input we're actually going to have to add some uh, sort of UI elements to the screen. And so what we're going to be mainly focusing on is adding those elements to the screen, setting up a couple of game states, and then um, finishing off the actual scoring system and getting all of that implemented. There's a couple things that uh, also will need to be adjusted and fixed along the way, so we will go ahead and go over that as well. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do is I actually want to add a mouse click behavior. So I'm just going to call that mouse click behavior. Okay, and to expedite this, I'm actually just going to paste some code in here because I think you guys have sort of watched me type out enough code. And what I want to do is go over sort of how this is implemented. So we have our, our typical data class which uh, extracts our properties. So we basically have a, a, a name uh, of the data, a width and a height, which defines sort of a size, and the message code to be sent when um, whatever we attach this data to is actually clicked within that. And so basically the way this is going to work is it'll be attached to a sim object and it will use the positioning of that sim object and then use uh, that in combination with this width and height and basically say uh, if we are within uh, those that that rectangle um, of space if our click is within uh, that rectangle of space then go ahead and send this message it's actually relatively straightforward so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in implementation uh, we've got our our typical uh, builder here. Uh, it's just the mouse click behavior and then the actual behavior here is actually pretty straightforward and you can see I've got a squiggly here because uh, we're going to actually um, we're going to add a uh, is visible property to our sim objects and I haven't done that yet and so uh, I'll come back to that but basically what this does is when it subscribes to the mouse up uh, message when it receives that, if the object it's attached to is not visible, it just boots out immediately because we don't want to process clicks on uh, objects that are not visible. Uh, otherwise, it extracts the world position and then gets the extent of that uh, of um, of the x and y. So it basically says world position plus width, world position um, y plus height. And then checks to see if it's within that. If it is, send the message. So this is really simple stuff. So I figured uh, it'd be quicker to just explain it rather than type it out all on screen. Okay, so the next thing that we need is we're going to need a visibility on message behavior. And we're actually going to need this to toggle visibility uh, for a particular object on and off when a message is received. So the reason that we're going to want this is we want a quick easy way to be able to show and hide um, objects on the screen uh, by message. 
And so again, I'm just going to paste in some code here that I wrote um, ahead of time and go through it. So again, we've got our data here. Uh, in this case, it's got the name of, of the uh, data, the message code that it's going to be listening for, and whether or not that message should um, set the visibil visibility uh, on the object it's attached to, to true or false. Uh, so the next thing, of course, is our builder. And then, as you might imagine, our visibility on message behavior is very short. Basically, it just subscribes for the message configured in the data. And when it receives that message, it goes ahead and sets the um, the owner, which is the object that it's attached to, uh, it sets the is visible flag to whatever was configured in the data. And that's really all this does. So again, this is really straightforward stuff. Uh, I didn't see the value of typing it out on screen. And in fact, I'm probably going to handle most things in this video that way, um, just to keep things rolling. So the next thing I think we ought to do is go ahead to the sim object and actually add the is visible property to it. Okay, so in sim object, what we're going to do is we're going to add some getters and setters for is visible. And of course, this looks at a private property that we don't have yet. So let's go ahead and add that. So it's private underscore is visible type boolean and we're going to actually default this to true because in most cases when we uh, actually create a, uh, a sim object we're going to want it to be visible by default so we're going to default that to true and so we have a getter and setter to be able to set that and get that value very easily and then one quick adjustment we're going to want to make is to render and before we do anything, we want to say if this dot is visible, if it's not visible rather, sorry, we're going to go ahead and return. And so basically what that's going to do is it's going to boot out immediately if this object is not visible. And you might ask, well, none of the components or the children will render e either. And due to the way that the hierarchy works, this is actually behavior that we want. So we actually get the the visibility uh, for free for all of these sub objects and components simply because uh, we boot out of this method early so it's um, it's actually a really nice quick way to be able to hide and show objects um, and have it affect all the children just by setting it in one place okay so one more quick change that we want to make is in the zone manager we actually want to send out a message uh, to basically say that the game is ready. And we're going to get a little bit more into this uh, in a bit when we get into game states. But I wanted to do this now before I actually forget. So in load zone, all the way at the end, after everything is loaded up, before we kick out of this function, we want to go ahead and, and send off this message. And again, I'll go into that a little bit when we get to the player controller and we start to add the state, but I wanted to go ahead and do that now before I forgot. Okay, so next are a couple of changes to the index HTML. So the first thing that I want to do is I actually want to make this look a little bit nicer by setting the background to black. Black. And, ah. and we also want to set some styles for the canvas and what we're going to uh, call a game area. And the goal of this is actually, if we were to run this game, let me actually backspace this for a second. So if we were actually to run this as it stands, the game is sort of jammed up in the top left corner and that's not really ideal. The way that we really want this to work is we want the game to sort of fill the entire um, entire screen while maintaining the aspect ratio. So you notice if we shrink down the window, um, I can't. I guess I can't shrink it down enough this direction. But if I shrink it down this way, um, the window doesn't actually change. The amount of rendered space doesn't actually change, and that's that's actually a major problem. 
And so what I want to happen is have this entire thing scale dynamically um, along with the game and maintain the same aspect ratio and maintain the same ultimate resolution uh, in this case so that uh, the game always looks correct and doesn't sort of um, you know show extra portions of the game or anything like that and so there's a couple of things that we need to actually adjust to make this happen there's some CSS changes that we need to make there are changes to the engine that we need to make to support this but what we're gonna wind up with is the canvas will essentially wind up centered and then um, if there is if there is extra space in one direction or the other it will actually put black bars um, on the sides or the top and the bottom of the screen depending um, on how you size it. So this will make a little bit more sense uh, when we get into it but I just kinda wanted to bring this up and, and explain that real quick. So let me just put my code back here. Okay. So the first thing that we do is we want to set the canvas to 100% width and height. And as it stands right now, we're actually creating our canvas dynamically. You'll notice there's nothing in the body. That's going to be changing too. I'll get to that in a minute. The canvas is actually going to be surrounded by a div with an ID of game area. And this will be absolutely positioned with a uh, left and top offset of 50%. So in other words, it's going to be centered. And then the engine is going to take that and dynamically resize it um, and maintain the aspect ratio appropriately so that uh, we actually have a centered viewport in the middle of the screen and at that point we can go ahead and resize and not have to worry about uh, the game breaking um, due to window size. So the second quick change that I'm going to make here is in the body I'm actually going to insert some content so I'm going to insert our div with our game uh, area as the ID and then our canvas element with an ID of viewport which we will use in a moment. So basically we're going to modify um, our call to our engine to um, take in this, uh, this, this name so that it can select that element by its ID and use it instead of actually creating one dynamically. So to do that we actually need to open up our app TS file and in the engine.start we need to just pass in uh, viewport as a string and that's actually all we're gonna have to do as far as that's concerned now you see that this is throwing an error so obviously we're gonna have to modify um, our engine to take this parameter in and use it instead so let's go ahead and do that now so to support this we're actually going to put in uh, a parameter called element name and that's going to be actually nullable it's gonna be a type string and what we're gonna do is we're going to pass to initialize and if you recall in our GL um, utilities initialize it actually can take optionally a, um, a string parameter too so it's basically just gonna pass this through as is if it's undefined it will operate as normal and go ahead and create a canvas for us uh, otherwise it will use the one that is uh, passed so basically we just wind up with a, uh, a pass through there so while we're in engine we actually need to add a couple more properties uh, so the first thing we want to do is we want to keep track of if we're on the first update and that's a boolean uh, and it defaults to true, right? Because the very first time this runs, um, we're going to be on our first update loop. And why that's important is going to be coming up in a bit, but just take that at face value for now. We also need a private underscore aspect, which is a number. And this is where we're actually going to store the aspect ratio. So the next update that we're going to make is we're going to actually replace all of this code in here that resizes the canvas. We're actually just going to update the aspect here because we're actually going to handle the canvas resizing elsewhere. So all we want to do, uh, at least for right now, in the start is just set the aspect ratio, which is uh, the game width and the game height. And we only want to do that if uh, if the game width is undefined or the, and the, sorry, if the game width is not equal to undefined as well as the game height is not equal to undefined.
since we deleted that logic uh, further up, what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to actually add this logic to our resize. So I'm actually just going to paste this in and then quickly explain how it works. So what we wind up here with is we actually change the GL viewport to the size of the window, um, the window uh, inner width and window inner height. If the uh, in the case that the game width uh, or the game height is undefined. So in other words, um, in the case that we don't define a width and a height, uh, we always want to just occupy all of the space on the screen um, all the time. And then uh, we also want our projection matrix to be regenerated at this time and take advantage of that. So um, basically what we're saying here is we're not maintaining an aspect ratio. Uh, we're just using um, the, the size of the window straight up uh, as is. So the else case, as you might have uh, noticed, is quite different. Um, or There's quite a lot going on here. So basically what this does is it takes the new size and it gets the aspect ratio of that, figures out how big to resize the game area, and then uh, it goes ahead and sets the style of, uh, of the game area to um, the appropriate width and height based on whether or not uh, there is extra space vertically or horizontally, which is what this code is doing here. So that's what essentially will give us our black bars. And then, um, or the, I should say the space for the black bars. Uh, and then it goes ahead and sets the uh, style of the margin and top uh, to be half of the height and half of the width, uh, negative half height and negative half width. And so if you recall, the CSS in here uh, was setting it to 50%, 50%. So that basically sets it in the center of the screen. And then we're saying, OK, now we want to actually offset it by half the width. So it's actually going to wind up centering it in the screen. OK, uh, then it goes ahead and sets the size of the canvas appropriately. It sets the GL viewport uh, to use the new width and the new height regenerates our um, projection matrix using the game width and game height, uh, and then also sets something called the resolution scale, uh, which the input manager will actually need when processing an input. And you'll notice that uh, there's actually not th any method here uh, for this yet. This is one update that we'll have to make um, to the input manager. Actually, the input manager is going to require a few updates, and this is one of them. So. Um, Take this one at face value for right now. Uh, we will come back to it. All right, so since we are actually handling the GL viewport and the projection, uh, in both of these scenarios, we actually no longer need this section of code down here. So we can get rid of that. OK, so one thing I want to add uh, to this loop is some code here for the first update. Now, this is not something that we need right this moment, but there are going to be circumstances where we want to know um, if it's the first update, because there there may be some operations that we want to take uh, before we actually perform update procedures. So I just wanted to sort of scaffold this out for right now. A couple of other updates I wanted to make. I want in the input manager initialize, it is actually going to need to know about this canvas. And that is because we are going to change the way that the uh, input manager actually binds some of its events, so it needs to bind it to the actual canvas element and not the entire window. And I'll go into that in a little bit, but while we're in the engine, I just wanted to go ahead and put that update here. Okay, so the next thing we're going to need is we're actually going to need some additional materials. Um, and so I'm actually just going to paste these in there because, again, you guys really don't need to watch me code this. So. We have uh, a few uh, new sprites that we're going to be creating, and they are going to be created from these assets here. So we have a play button um, for us to enable, uh, or for, for the user to be able to start uh, the game. We have a restart button. We have a score background that's going to tell us what our score um, for the current game is, as well as what our best uh, game was. Uh, we've got a title graphic here, and then we've got a small tutorial. So the small tutorial basically shows up anytime we reset the game, just to remind the user, hey, this is how you play it. It's just a nice, quick visual cue um, 
to remind the user. So basically, uh, the play button only shows up the very first time when you launch the game, and then once you click play, it'll say, hey, this is how you do it, and then you tap this, and then the game starts. When you finish, uh, it will actually show this and this. Um, and it'll say, he here's your score, and then uh, the user would click restart, and uh, then it would go back to this tutorial screen where it says, okay, here's how you play it. And so it's just going to kind of follow that, that basic loop um, of logic. So I don't really want to go too deep into that for right now, but what I do want to do is, since we are referencing these in our code, I want to go ahead and copy these over to our assets. So let's put that in textures. Okay. Okay, so that is actually it for the engine. So the next thing I'm going to do is handle this input manager business so that we can actually get the input manager uh, fixed and operating the way that it needs to. So let me go ahead and go to that. And so if we go to our initialize, uh, it is now actually expecting a HTML canvas element. Let's go ahead and add a viewport HTML canvas element argument. Okay. We're also actually going to need to reference vector2 uh, because we're going to have to actually start storing some stuff about um, storing and dealing with some data uh, about um, scales and, and um, positions. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is in our input manager, I'm going to add a property, which is the resolution scale. And I, I alluded to this earlier, uh, but basically what this is going to do is uh, based on our resolution, uh, the size of the screen versus the actual resolution of the game, we need to determine uh, what the difference is between those, and that is actually the scale. So we're going to default this to vector2.1. And as we resize the screen, this resolution scale will actually change. In initialize, uh, we notice, uh, you may have noticed that I added this viewport, uh, but we haven't used it yet. So basically, these bottom three events are going to get sort of remap. So right now we're actually binding these um, mouse move, mouse down, and mouse up to the window, which we don't want to do. We want to bind them to the viewport instead. Uh, and that will keep uh, mouse click events that happen outside of our window from actually registering and sending messages, uh, which is not something we want. We only want messages to be handled that are actually clicked inside our viewport. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is just add a quick uh, static setter for our resolution scale so that uh, this can be uh, set by the engine in our resize. Um, so if you recall here, we're getting a resolution scale and then in the input manager we're setting that resolution scale uh, based off the width, um, the new width versus the game width and the new height versus the game height. Uh, okay. So the next thing that um, I want to change is Right now, we're basically taking the event client X and client Y and just using them straight up as is. And the problem with this is when we resize the window, our game gets scaled down. And so the place that we click on the screen can I, will definitely be off um, if the screen isn't perfectly uh, scaled to actually match our game's resolution. So we need to actually scale these values. So I'm going to get rid of these two. And instead, I'm going to go ahead and get the event target, which is basically what was clicked on. So that's always going to be our viewport. And I'm going to say uh, our mouse X is actually going to be the event client X, just as before. Uh, but we're actually going to transform it um, by the rounded value of the rect.left. Um, and then one divided by the resolution scale dot x. So it's basically going to scale this up or down based on um, what the relative size of the window is, um, or I'm sorry, the viewport is versus the actual expected resolution of the game. So this will give us a proper input. If we didn't do this, um, our mouse coordinates and our clicks would all be horribly, horribly off. Um, and then one small thing, um, 
I'm going to go ahead and remove these comments because we're never actually going to re-enable that. We don't want to capture keyboard input in that way. If we ever do, I can always add them back, but um, the comments were sort of bothering me, so I'm going to go ahead and remove those. All right, so that should be all that we need to do as far as the input manager and the engine go. So let's go ahead and just build this and do a quick run to make sure we didn't break anything. Okay, so now you will see that we actually have um, the black bars that I mentioned before. It's centered within our screen, so it looks a lot better. It looks a lot um, sort of more professional. Uh, if we shrink this down, we see that our game scales appropriately. If we scale it up, we can see that um, it scales up appropriately. If we, um, if we shrink this down, let's see. I guess, there we go. So if we set it to some really oblong um, resolution, uh, you can see here that the black bars uh, work in that direction as well. So if I expand this, you'll see how it just kind of goes back and forth between the two. So that all works very nicely. Um, we pretty much won't ever have to touch that stuff again. Um, so I wanted to go ahead and just sort of get that out of the way. All right, let's move on. So the next thing that I wanted to fix is actually in the animated sprite component. Um, so if we look, uh, actually let me run this again just to sort of demonstrate. If we look, we actually don't have control right now over how fast these animations play, uh, what the frame time of these animations are. And so this is actually pretty slow. Um, we want this to actually go a lot faster just to sort of seem a little bit more active. So we need to add something to actually give us that flexibility. And so I'm going to add something to the component data called frame time and it's going to default to 33. And just like you guys have seen me do so many times, uh, I'm just going to extract the property from the JSON um, like so and cast it to a number. Pretty straightforward stuff. So the next thing that I want to address is this animated sprite constructor because we have a lot of properties here and this isn't really manageable anymore. So I want to create sort of a structure to sort of contain all these properties so that way I can basically fill out a structure and just pass uh, that uh, structure to the animated sprite constructor. So I'm actually going to head, head over to animated sprite and let's see right right above the actual animated sprite class I'm going to create a new class called animated sprite info. And this is basically just going to act as a structure and so this is going to contain uh, the properties along with a lot of their defaults that are used in this constructor and not have us have to pass so many things uh, into this constructor. It's just going to kind of clean things up a little bit and make it nicer to work with. The next thing that you'll notice in here is I actually have a to-do that says make this configurable. So that's what we're doing now. I'm going to kill that and I'm going to default this instead of to basically a third of a second. I'm going to cut it down to 33 as a default. I'm also going to change this constructor to just take a info object and that is going to be of type animated sprite info. And let's go ahead and update the comments. The information uh, used to create this animated sprite. And I'm going to clip the rest of that. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do is. Oops, I'm basically going to update the super call to pull the information straight from the structure itself. So the name, material name, width, and height. Uh, and then obviously uh, these properties will need to be pulled from the info as well. So I could just put info dot in front of those guys. And then of course add one for our frame time pulling from the info. And I think that's actually it for the animated sprites. So let's go ahead and close that. And so now we're left with this. So let's go ahead and clean this up. 
Okay, so right underneath autoplay, we're actually going to go ahead and set up our sprite info object. And then we're actually just going to pass sprite info to the constructor there. And I believe that's actually all we need to do for that. Okay, so that takes care of that. So let's just go ahead and build this and run it just to verify. And it's going much, much faster, which is actually kind of what we want. Now, it looks a little bit silly um, because this isn't actually animating, but, um, you know, it's not, it's not moving up and down, but it will, I promise, look correct when we're actually playing the game. All right, so the next component that we need to make a tiny tweak to is the bitmap text component because right now we actually don't have a way to update its text um, unless we actually have a reference to it. And that's not um, the best way to sort of handle this. So what we're going to do is we're going to implement iMessage Handler and we're going to have this subscribe to a message where we can basically say, hey, a bitmap text component named this set your text to whatever. Okay, and so in the constructor we're basically going to say right there listen for text updates. And then down here we are going to add an on message callback uh, that is basically going to say um, it's going to uh, handle this message. So we're saying um, this set text um, if the message is that then we go ahead and update the um, the text to be the context. So if we send a message with uh, this code, this component is expecting that the context be a string. So uh, basically, we can um, set we can send this message from anywhere in the game and have it automatically just update the text just by setting the context. Okay, that's it for that. Also, need to make a tiny tweak to, whoops, not the component manager, the collision manager. Because what's happening right now is we're actually sending um, some duplicate information here. Uh, we're basically colliding with everything twice, uh, which is not really what we want to do. So we're going to have to fix a couple things here. Basically what we're doing here is uh, we're still sending uh, the on-collision entry to both objects so that they're both aware of it, but we're only sending one message. And instead of sending the name of the object along with the code, uh, what we're actually going to do is we're going to send uh, that information is actually available in the, um, the call object or the collision data object. Since that actually contains a reference to both objects, there's no reason to send two messages uh, with codes um, containing the name actually in the code um, since the collision information actually contains everything we need anyway. So this is actually going to make message subscriptions a lot easier to manage because uh, we could just say now listen for collision entry and then check the context um, uh, collision data and then look at the names of um, component A and com component B uh, to see w uh, what their names are and if they match our criteria. So uh, I've gone ahead and made that update here and then the next update is obviously going to be made here. So it's the same thing. Um, instead of sending the objects we're just going to send data through uh, since it actually contains everything that we need. And this is actually going to resolve uh, another bug that um, I noticed, and I don't know if, if viewers noticed it, but basically we are colliding with everything twice. Those things were, were registering twice, so this will go ahead and resolve that. Okay, so the next change I want to make is actually to Rectangle 2D, and I want to make a change here because this point uh, in shape uh, test with two objects isn't always exactly going to line up. So um, let me just pull up paint here to illustrate what I'm talking about. Let's say that we have one object that looks like this. And let's say that we have another object that looks like this. Now, the points of both of these objects 
are as follows. So this technically is going to fail our collision test because none of these points are within the points of the other object. And so this is actually not sufficient um, to just check to see if the points are within one object or the other because if you have a case like this, it's going to fail. And so what we actually need to do is we need to check the sides in an axis aligned uh, way to say, you know, if this edge uh, is between this edge and this edge, um, then we definitely have a collision. Or if this edge is between this edge and this edge, then we have a collision. Or this edge is between this one and this one, you guys get the point. So if any of those things are true, then we have a collision. So let's just get rid of my terrible drawing there. And let's go ahead and change the implementation of this intersects. So we want to keep point and shape because it is useful for us to know that, but we need a another uh, private utility method. So basically this is going to say, uh, get me the extents for the shape, which is the rectangle 2D. And what this is going to do is this is going to handle all the negative uh, height and width issues. And it's basically going to say, uh, give me the left, the right, the top, and the bottom and then we're going to return that as a new rectangle 2D. So it's basically going to get rid of any negative values that might uh, that might exist in the actual uh, rectangle that's passed in, and it's going to return one that's only dealing with positives so that our actual uh, check becomes much, much easier. So the next thing we're going to do is we're actually going to nuke that code. And in our inter intersects, if we're dealing with a rectangle 2D, uh, we're basically going to get the extents of this and get the extents of the other. And those are actually what we're going to be testing. And the test actually looks like this. So we're saying if A, position X, is less or equal than B width, and A width is greater than or equal to B position X, and then basically the same thing for Y, um, that will either return true or false. So basically what we wind up with is a nice simple check to see if uh, we're actually intersecting with the other shape that's passed through. So as you can see, uh, this is a lot simpler to understand than what we had before, uh, simply based off the fact that uh, we have this get extents, which can be used for both of these objects and then we can simply deal with all positive values and we don't have to worry about that outside of this. Now one thing that you might have noticed is we're actually getting the red squiggly down here and that is because our current implementation of this does not actually have a constructor which means it has a default constructor which has no values, um, which has no uh, uh, arguments rather. So what we're going to need to do is underneath the properties, we're going to go ahead and create our constructor, which has defaults of 0 for x, y, width, and height, and we're just going to set those things here. And now we should be all good. So the default constructor basically will work if you pass nothing in here like we used to do. You will just get something with all the zeros. Uh, if you want to create one like this, you can actually just pass in x, y, uh, extent uh, y, uh, x and y. Great. That is it for Rectangle 2D. One of the last things that we're going to have to change is the scroll behavior. So let me just build this real quick and run. So if we play this game right now, which I'm not actually going to do, what you'll notice here is uh, all these pipes are actually the same, um, the same position. And it doesn't, it's not really challenging, right? So what we need to do is we need some way to define a minimum and maximum Y reset position so that one of these will, will appear here, maybe the next one will appear, um, you know, up here somewhere, the next one will appear down here somewhere. It just makes everything a little bit more challenging instead of just going in a straight line through the thing. You have to go up and down and flap your way through things. So uh, in order to support that, we need to modify our scroll behavior a little bit. We have our min position. And what I'm going to do is add some overrides for the min, um, I'm sorry, the reset position. Uh, I'm going to add some overrides for the reset position. 
um, on the y-axis. One thing that uh, a lot of a lot of people may notice is the fact that uh, you know I don't have an override uh, for the X and I'm not gonna bother with that because to be completely honest this component is a one-off for this game I will never use this component again so I'm not really concerned with how extensible this particular component is it's really specialized for this game and so um, I'm just going to add a quick property here to override the min and max reset y and basically what that's going to be used for is to provide a range where I will generate a random number between the minimum and the maximum to uh, to reset the y uh, position to okay so obviously with that in the set from JSON we we need to copy over those properties if they are defined if they are not defined it will operate as normal and of course in the scroll behavior itself I will need to add the min and max reset y and of course in the constructor if those things are not uh, undefined then I will go ahead and add them uh, or uh, set them rather there as well so if they're undefined again uh, nothing new will happen so it doesn't break anything that might be uh, depending on this uh, for backward compatibility such as the ground um, that we don't want to have this new behavior. Okay, so one thing that we're going to do is uh, basically in the update where we're checking to see our um, X uh, position to see if we are actually at the position where we need to reset, uh, I'm going to change the condition and what happens inside. So basically the scroll Y um, is a just a quick flag to determine uh, if we're going to wind up uh, performing a random scroll operation on the y-axis and basically that's just looking to see if min reset x and min reset y are undefined um, or not undefined rather so when we're doing this check we're also going to check to see if we're um, if we're gonna scroll y or if we're not gonna scroll y and um, the position y is is less than um, the position Y on um, min position. And so basically when those things uh, occur then we reset. And that will make more sense in a moment. So the next thing is we're actually going to replace the contents of the reset method with this. So basically we're going to say uh, if we're using the uh, the min reset Y and min reset max reset Y rather min and max if we're using those things uh, then we're going to set the transform position to uh, the reset position X, which is the same behavior as it was doing before in the X axis, but the Y we're going to get a random Y, and we'll fill that out in a minute. Otherwise, it's just going to use the default behavior that was there before. Okay, so let's go ahead and add get random Y. So get random Y, as you might expect from my uh, explanation, is basically going to get a, uh, a sort of uh, integer value um, of the random uh, based on the range of the min and max uh, reset y position. And so uh, this is actually uh, making sure that we actually can we include the minimum and the maximum values in our random uh, generator. So uh, I'm not actually going to really go into the reasons why this is set up this way but just know that this is inclusive of the values um, set in, in the uh, data of the min and max set in the data. And I believe that is actually all we need to do for the scroll comp uh, the scroll behavior. So well, let me just format that real quick. Yeah, I think that's it. Let's go ahead and build that. Make sure it builds. Okay. Okay, so now for the large update, um, which is going to be in the player behavior. And one thing that uh, I do want to sort of review in the postmortem uh, after this project is, is complete is some of the drawbacks to this class, because this class has really got a lot going on in it. Uh, again, this is a one-off behavior for this game. It's never going to be used again. Um, so I'm not really worried about making this too extensible. Uh, but there's a lot of logic in here that might be 
better split off into other areas uh, in the future. So just bear that in mind as we're sort of building this is that um, some of these things are done because they're just a one-off to support this particular game. And it's not necessarily a best practice to always do things this way, but sometimes simplicity um, is the way to go. And so uh, that's what we're going to be doing here. Okay, so in the player behavior data, we're going to add a new property called score collision component. What this is going to be is it's going to be a invisible collision that actually exists in between the space of our pipe. So if I load this up right here, we're basically going to have a collision object uh, that is in this area right here so that when we collide with it, and it's going to be over towards this side, so that when we collide with this, uh, we can increment the score. And so uh, we only want to do that, obviously, if we um, are alive. Uh, and so we'll get to that in a little bit. But uh, I basically just wanted to sort of point out what the score collision component is. For each one of these pipes, there will be an invisible uh, basic hitbox there uh, that will be used to increment the score when the player collides with it if they are alive. So as you may have guessed, uh, since we're adding this here, we need to save off the score collision component uh, from the JSON object that we load in. And I believe that's actually it for the behavior data. Moving on to the behavior. So obviously we need to store our score collision component in our player behavior. And we also need to store uh, a score and a high score to display um, in those fields that I uh, mentioned before. So the high score will only be updated if the score is ever greater than it, and the score will be updated and reset per uh, per game. So every time the game uh, or every time the player dies, the score will be reset to zero, and every time they go through a pipe, it will be incremented by one. And at the end of the game, if that um, if that score is greater than higher score, then high score will be updated. And, and then these values are what will be used uh, and shown on the screen uh, by those text objects that we will create later. So obviously we want to copy over our score collision component. And if you recall in our collision system, we actually are subscribing for collision entry um, only. And so we do not need to listen for that anymore. We can just listen for collision entry. And then um, we actually want to subscribe to these following messages. So we have a game ready, game reset, game start, and player died. Uh, these are what messages will be used to actually transition our state from one to another. And I will get to state uh, in a little bit. So let's have a look at the on message. Obviously, we need to update this because we are no longer listening for that. We just need collision entry. Okay, and we are actually going to replace this line with this. So basically what we're saying here is if we're in a situation where the name of the data A or data B uh, is not the player, then we don't care about the collision and we can boot out early. So this is a slight optimization just to sort of speed things up a little bit. And then here we can say um, if the uh, if the if we're collided with our ground collision component, uh, die and decelerate as we did before. Uh, the next thing that I want to do is, uh, since basically we're not ever going to collide with the ground collision and the pipe at the same time, I want to go ahead and just change this to an else if. And um, that will just keep us from also having to perform this check. Basically, if we hit the ground, uh, we don't also need to check to see if we hit a pipe because we just need to die. Uh, and so if either one of those things happens, uh, we're calling die. So it's sufficient to just um, optimize this a little bit further by saying um, else if and just making it part of that same statement. To this, I want to add one more section. And that section is going to take a look at our new score collision component. And so what this is going to say is if we have collided essentially with our score collision component, then next, check to see if we are live and that we're in a playing state. If we are, then we want to set this score, uh, the, the score uh, to be 
uh, one greater than it currently is. And once I fill out this function, you'll actually see the reason I'm doing it this way, because a lot of people would say, well, why don't you just say this score plus plus? I could do that. Um, in fact, I could do that uh, here. But I don't want to actually modify this value yet when I'm setting it here. So um, this is actually intentional. This is not an accident, and I will show you why I did that later. The next thing that I want to do is I actually want to play the ting sound. So every time you you go through a score collision component, we want to play an audible sound uh, that says, hey, we just got a point. And so it just kind of gives the user a little bit of extra feedback that, hey, um, we're, we're continuing to collect points as we go along. Okay, so the next thing that we need to do is we need to uh, start thinking about game states. So uh, when we reset the um, the game, when we call game reset, uh, this is basically going to show the tutorial. It's going to show the um, uh, you'll you'll basically want to click the tutorial to actually uh, do game start, uh, which is what this one is. And so right above this reset, we want to send some additional messages. So we want to first off hide the game and we're going to set up what that actually is um, in our uh, our level in a bit. We want to um, hide the reset button, we want to uh, hide the splash, and we want to show the tutorial. Now I realize that these uh, objects haven't been set up, but I'm choosing to implement all of this in code first um, and then I will show you what the configuration will look like that actually supports all of this afterwards uh, so that we can uh, then see how all of this sort of comes together. So I want to attack the code aspect of this first and then move on to the configuration of the zone. So as I mentioned before, game start starts the main game. So this is a state um, where we are um, in uh, we're basically playing the game. This kicks us into the, the playing of the game. And so as you might have gathered, we need to send some more messages. So this is basically saying we want to show the gameplay elements. We want to uh, hide the reset button. We want to hide the splash and we want to hide the tutorial. Now, this may seem res redundant, but the reason that we're doing this is we want to make sure that absolutely sure that all of the components that should be hidden are hidden and all the components that should be shown are shown. And so these messages help us do that. The other thing we're doing is we're obviously setting the is playing and is alive flags to true. So the next uh, state is going to be the game ready. And if you recall, we actually added this to the, um, the zone manager. And we're basically saying um, our zone is loaded. So we want to um, we want to actually show not the tutorial the play button uh, we want to show uh, the play button uh, slash splash screen oops okay so we're basically saying make sure the reset button is hidden hide the tutorial hide the game show the splash. Okay, and the last one is when the player dies. And this one is actually sort of a sub-state of play. Uh, we're basically saying when we receive the message that the player died, uh, we want to show the reset button and the score. And so uh, both those things are actually tied to re the reset, excuse me, the reset show message. Okay, um, so those are the basic uh, states of the game, and now that we have that in place, we can show and hide objects appropriately, and again, I realize we haven't created those objects, we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, there's a couple things that I want to tie up uh, in this uh, player behavior first. So the first of those things is the should not flap. Uh, there's actually a bug here where this should be a not, so uh, basically if we are not playing, then we should not flap. Um, so that was just a bug that was in there previously, um, and it was causing the bird uh, not to flap while we were playing and to flap while we were not playing, which is not what we want. Okay, so one minor thing we want to change in reset is to set the score back to zero. Again, we haven't set up uh, the set score method. Uh, we'll come back to that, but we want to, uh, anytime we reset, we want to reset the score back to zero. 
Okay, so the next thing is right before uh, our on restart, we're going to create our set square method. And this is uh, what I was talking about up top. So we just pass in what the score should be, and we set the score to that. So the next thing uh, that it does is it sets the text of the counter, which is that big uh, zero that's in the middle of the screen right now. It sets that to the score. Um, and then it also sets the score text, which is on that um, that screen, the reset screen, uh, the current score. It sets that text. And then it also uh, checks to see if the score is greater than the high score. And if it is, it sets the high score to that. And then sends a message to set the high score text to that text. So every time we set the score, um, we're just doing this logic. So all of this is encap encapsulated in here and uh, is very nice and conveniently wrapped up. Uh, and we actually have this on restart method which uh, never actually gets called, so I'm going to nuke it because uh, reset actually handles all of that. So uh, that was redundant, don't need it anymore. And that is actually all the changes in player behavior, which finally leaves the zone configuration. So, the zone configuration what I'm actually going to do is I'm actually just going to copy this whole thing um, in because there is a lot that's happened here and going through this uh, piece by piece would take quite a while. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to uh, copy that in and then we're actually going to look at the diff of that versus the um, the current version uh, that is checked in and this will allow us to sort of see um, what some of those things are that have changed. So if I go over here to Team Explorer and I check changes uh, and I look here at test zone JSON. This will actually show me the diff of everything that's changed. And as you can see, uh, there is a lot of green here. So, what a uh, a diff is for those of you who have never um, used this thing, this type of thing before, is uh, it's a element of source control that. Uh, that basically allows you to see what changes have been made since the last version of the file. And uh, if you're familiar with, with something like Git or TFS, this is a very common uh, thing that you'll want to take a look at before you check code in so that you can see what all the changes are that you've made. So, uh, for example, uh, let me find a simple one here. If I look at scroll behavior, for example, uh, we can see here all the changes that I've made. Now, some of these things are just formatting. Uh, the reds are typically deletes. The greens are additions. Um, in this case, I deleted a bunch of spaces here when I did some formatting. Uh, but we can see here uh, there was nothing on this side, and we added this logic here. So it gives us an idea of what was added, what was removed. Yeah, so app is actually a simple example, right? So we can see here that I've removed some spaces, and uh, I added the viewport text to the engine.start. So um, a diff is a very nice way to sort of get um, an idea of what's changed in the file. I don't really want to go um, into source control any deeper than that. I may make some videos on it if there is enough demand in the future. Uh, but for now, uh, basically just accept this as face value is these are changes that we've made to the file. So on this side is what is currently, um, or what is the old version of the file, and on this side is what the new version of the file is. So what we've done, is we've gone through to our pipe one scroller uh, behaviors. We added our min and max reset ranges. And uh, we've also added our uh, visibility on message behavior, which you can see in this case is tied to game show. So uh, this pipe will be shown when the game show is uh, message is sent, and it will be hidden when the game hide message is sent. Uh, and you can just see that from the configuration here. So visible is true for game show, visible is false for game hide. Uh, that's as far as I want to go into that. Uh, if we look at this uh, pipe one score, this is the invisible collision component that I was talking about. 
So we've set the position uh, basically to be that space in between the top and bottom pipes. Uh, and then we've defined uh, the width and height of that um, to be uh, an area that is 34 um, to, to the left and 122 from the top of the pipe object. Uh, and then it has a width of 10 and a height of 128, which makes up for that gap that is between the pipes. So basically, if you pass through the pipes without hitting the pipes, um, you will hit this score collision, which will cause a um, in, an increment um, of the score um, in in the player uh, the player behavior. So uh, the re the way that it does that is by the score collision name, which I'll show you when we get to the uh, configuration um, for that particular behavior. So scrolling down a bit, we see now that we're on our pipe 2, again we have our, our reset and our visibility, same stuff, uh, and then here we have our score, and if we sc scroll down to pipe 3, uh, which is this one here, uh, we have our min and max, uh, and again our uh, show and hide, as well as our score. So uh, it looks like there's a lot of changes in here, but a lot of this stuff was repeated just um, for the pipes alone. Uh, here, uh, for some reason, I added an empty line. I'm not really sure why I did that. Uh, so the next thing that changed is in the ground scroller, I actually took away the start message. Um, I'm sorry, the stop message, because I don't ever want it to stop. Once we've started playing, um, I basically want it to continue um, unless... Uh, well, I actually don't ever really want it to stop. I, I always want it to continue. Um, that way I don't have to stop and start it uh, as I was doing before. So the uh, the start message is when the game is shown, uh, it starts, uh, and then there just isn't a stop message. And so the same is true for the ground scroller 2. Okay, so uh, the next thing that we have here is the duck animated sprite, which we have our frame time. If you recall, the default was 33. Uh, I found that to be a little bit too fast, so I actually set that to 66. And then uh, the player controller is actually where I hook up a lot of this stuff. So uh, we have a score collision component, which takes in the score collision. So if you recall, this is the actual same name as the score collision component. So any time it collides with anything with this name, uh, it increases the score. Uh, here is the show and hide for that. Uh, obviously on game show uh, sets visible to true, game hide sets visibility to false. Uh, here we have the counter text, uh, which is the actual uh, text um, object um, that we're using that, that has the initial volu uh, value text value of zero. Uh, it was called test text object. That's not very descriptive, so I just renamed it. Uh, and then um, here's our actual uh, bitmap um, component. And now we've attached um, some uh, some behaviors uh, to the actual um, the actual uh, duck. It looks like yes. Uh, so we've attached. Um, some some behaviors to that, which uh, basically uh, allow us to turn on the. Wait a minute. Let me see something here. This is behaviors components counter text. Okay, the the naming of these is actually wrong. So that should be show counter text. That's why I was getting confused. That's sometimes what happens when you copy and paste. <laughs> um, happens to the best of us. Okay, so show counter text, hide counter text. Uh, so uh, this is the show and hide for that. Then we have the title, which is our uh, our title graphic that we have here, which is a stupid duck. Uh, and of course, it also has its positional data and then um, its uh, material. And then we have our show and hide for that. And our play button, uh, which is this guy um, with a show and hide for it. Uh, and then also um, for our play button, we've actually defined a mouse click. So that's where this is. And you can see um, when we click on that, we're sending game reset. The second thing that we've done is we've actually created a sort of a, a separate duck um, that we don't want attached to the game. It's, it's basically a copy 
um, of the duck. And actually, we have a, uh, a duck animated sprite here um, that is basically the same configuration as, as the one that we actually use in play. But this one is the one that shows up on the title screen. So it's just a separate one that's positioned a little bit differently, um, and it's only used and shown on the title screen. And uh, it is shown uh, only on the splash screen, so obviously when the splash hide is called, uh, it goes away. So it's just a, a way to sort of uh, keep it separate and not confuse it uh, with the one that we use for the actual game. The next is the tutorial. It's the same exact stuff, the same pattern that we've seen. Um, the tutorial has a, a show and hide. It can be clicked on as well. When you click on the tutorial, it sends game start, which actually starts the game. The score is um, the background sprite. So if we look at that, that's this guy here. And so same thing, show and a hide. Not really anything complicated there. So we have a score text, which is the value that is in the top of this guy. So it will appear here. Uh, so it has uh, a, um, a show and a hide as well. And then we have a best uh, text, which also has a show and a hide of its own. Uh, let's see. And then we have a uh, game over text, which is basically just another um, uh, text object that displays this game over text. And again, a show and a hide based on reset show or reset hide. And finally, our restart button, which appears below the uh, score, which is this guy here, which has a show, a hide, and a mouse click. So it, it, it looks like um, it's, it's a lot. And honestly, I mean, to type this out by hand, it did take me a while. Uh, but it's not, um, none of it's complicated. You know, it's, it's more, um, it just takes time to, to put it together. Uh, and that's really all it is. So I'm going to go ahead and build this. And let's run it. And now you'll see that things look vastly different. So we have our stupid duck, uh, our title graphic here. We have our play. Um, you'll notice that I don't get the random click uh, sounds when I'm not playing the game anymore um, because we're still on the play screen. So if I, I can scroll this, I can hit play. And then it shows our, our tutorial. Looks like we have small graphic artifact right there. I'm not sure what's causing that. I'll have to fix that at some point. Uh, but if we click anywhere outside of that tutorial, uh, nothing happens. But if we click on the tutorial itself, then we're launched into the game. And you can see, as I'm going here, we get some random values on our pipes. And as we pass each pipe, uh, our counter is actually going up. And you can hear the sound. The sound is a little faint. Um, I might want to swap that sound out for something uh, else in the future, but uh, I think uh, for now um, it's enough for you guys to at least sort of get the point. So there's a couple things that uh, I would like to tweak about this. Uh, the collision detection is not perfect. Um, it still probably needs a little bit of tweaking. Uh, the other thing is you'll notice every once in a while down here we get a, a sort of gap in the ground. <coughs> Excuse me, and that is because of how we're actually resetting this. Um, we probably ought to fix that at some point. I'm not going to fix it uh, for this game because I think that this has gone on long enough. I challenge, though, uh, any of you guys out there that uh, do want to fix these bugs, um, feel free to fix the bug and let me know what the fix is. Um, I just don't kind of want to look into it anymore. I kind of want to move on um, from this. But uh, you can see here that we have our score. Our, um, our best of 25, uh, and then I can uh, click restart here. It gives me the tutorial again. Now I'll go ahead and just fail right away here. So we can see our score was zero, our best is 25. Now let me actually get one, fail again, and then we have our score one and 25. Obviously if you reload the game, it's not gonna save your best score. There are things that we could do to save off this best score, maybe to local storage or something like that. Again. I challenge uh, you guys, if you want to look up how a local storage works, uh, feel free to implement that. In fact, we're probably going to be uh, implementing local storage in a future game project. So I'm not going to actually bother doing that right now uh, because there are a lot of things that I want to move on to. Um, 
that I feel are a lot more important than that. So um, that is pretty much it, guys. Uh, the game is complete for the most part. It's got some bugs, it's got some tweaks, um, but all of it's minor. None of it is game-breaking. Um, so what we have here is a fully complete game uh, in an engine that we wrote from scratch using WebGL and TypeScript. And this is a, um, if, if you followed along and you actually have gotten to this point and your game is running successfully without bugs, without errors, you really should uh, congratulate yourself at this point because you have done something that many, many people in the world have not done. You have completed a game. Now, granted, yes, there are some issues with it. There are some graphical artifacts and things like this that, that need to be addressed. Um, but for all intents and purposes, this game is, is I would say, in, in beta stage right now, right? So you could, you could hand this off to people to start testing. Somebody could load this up on their phone and play it. You could put this on a website right now and it will run. And um, just getting to that point alone, you've done something that so many people out there have not done. So definitely uh, take time to take that in. Um, and what we're going to do in the next video is before we move on, to the next project with this engine and extending the engine, I actually kind of want to have a, uh, a sort of post-mortem uh, discussion on what some of the uh, positives and negatives of the engine um, are so far, what some of the things are that I have learned and um, discovered along the way as I have been working on this. And I also want to take uh, a little bit of time and get some feedback from some of you guys on this so that uh, I'm fully aware of what your guys' thoughts on this, what some of the things you guys would like to see. So be on the lookout for the post-mortem video, which will come after this one. And thank you guys for following along. Thank you guys for watching. And if you haven't already, consider subscribing. And I will see you guys next time.